Hello and welcome to episode three of Storytime. Today we are going to talk about a little trip that I took many, many years ago. So not only are we talking about traveling the world, but also about time travel because things were so much different back then, a long time ago. And how fun is it to talk about traveling during a time where no one's really supposed to be traveling? So we can just relive our old experiences and hope someday again soon we might create new ones. So this all started when I put a poll on my Instagram about whether to talk about roller derby, which is something I will talk about down the road, but also um, I was an exchange student. Yo fui Argentina en el año 2003 y 2004 porque estaba una estudiante de intercambio. So Spanish is a little rusty. I was an exchange student when I was 19 years old. As someone who acknowledges that I'm extremely shy and introverted, even at my age now, I was 20 billion times way worse when I was in high school. And honestly, the only reason I even applied for an exchange student program when I was in my grade 12 year, my last year of high school was because I met um, a few people that were exchange students in my school. And I also had a few friends that did the exchange that were older than me that had gone and come back and told me about it. And it just felt like it would be amazing to travel somewhere other than where I had been born and raised my entire life and experience a whole other part of the world. But I also knew that I was so shy and it would also be one of my worst nightmares to kind of be transplanted into another completely different environment. However, I just, for me, a lot of times throughout my life, and especially then, I learned in a very essential tool to becoming an adult, I feel, which is faking it until you make it. I feel like that is just what we all do. We all just fake that we know what we're doing our entire lives through um, young adults, when we're preteens, teenagers, to adulthood and beyond. We don't know what we're doing. Nobody nobody really knows what they're doing. And we just say, sure, yeah, I, I would be good at that. And then you just close your eyes and hope for the best. At least that's what I've been doing for the last like three decades. So basically to apply for this program at that time, you filled out a actual paper application. You hand wrote it, hand wrote, hand write it. You hand wrote, anyway, a paper application, submitted some sort of kind of a resume of accomplishments that you've had as an 18 year old. I really obviously had not many accomplishments at that time other than working as an ice cream scooper part time. I worked at a concession stand. I think I played soccer <laughs> and was like on the cross country team in school. So those are my accomplishments. And you go through this crazy process. You have to be interviewed by all these adults who are in charge of this program. And then they actually decided what country I should go to and what, where I would fit. You didn't get to decide for yourself. They, they would interview you and they would also, it was through a program where we brought exchange students to Canada. And so those families whose children came to Canada would open up their homes generally to bringing Canadian students somewhere else. So throughout my entire grade 12 year, I went through that process and near the end of the year, I found out that I had been accepted into the program and that I would be going to France. At the time, I definitely had shown interest in the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, the RCMP, the Canadian Police. I went to a boot camp in grade 12 for my um, spring break because I was super cool. So I could see why they thought maybe if I went to France, learn French, it would be very beneficial if I was going to become a police officer. Because again, I didn't have a lot of variety in, in describing who I was. I was only 18 years old. I had no idea. So they kind of took from that and... I'm sure any normal, regular person would be very excited to go to France. However, the, the one student that I'd really connected with that had been 
an exchange student to my school was from Mexico. So in my mind, I just really wanted to go somewhere where they spoke Spanish. It's gonna be hot all the time. I could escape the winter. I was not a big winter person at this time. And also I had like an 18 year old brain. So I really just wasn't thinking of long-term benefits or anything like that. So I actually called the program back and asked if there's any other countries available. <laughs> To go to and i can't even believe i did this but i just i just felt in my heart that that's not where i needed to go and so they offered argentina and honestly when my sponsor the person that was arranging my exchange mentioned argentina to me and said that's the only other spot and i was like yeah take it let's do this and i hung up the phone and i was like i don't know where argentina is i honestly didn't know where argentina was and then I went over to a globe that I had in my room and I found it and it was very far down south and I was just like, yes! Found out they spoke Spanish, was thrilled because I've been practicing Spanish with my friend from Mexico and yeah, I found out that I was leaving in the summer of my grad year and that I had a list of stuff to pack and then basically I was going to go live with a family in Argentina for a year. So during the whole exchange student application process, I kind of related it a lot to just applying for jobs. That's when I had just started working, you know? So that part was uncomfortable, but I was able to kind of fake it till I made it kind of idea with all of that. But once I got accepted in the program and I actually was going, um, that's when the real panic set in. I would never traveled really anywhere. Most of us haven't at that age. I'd been on one trip to Hawaii with my mom and my soccer team and that's it so fast forward to the day I'm leaving Canada for a year to Argentina to a family I've never met mind you there's no Facebook there's no iPhones there's no iMessage there's not even like we I had a blackberry no I didn't even have a blackberry I had a flip phone and was not bringing that with me and you know there was just no uh, phone call programs like plans for like long distance that far i emailed with this family like a handful of times and the family that i was matched up with spoke english quite well and had lived in the states on and off so the communication was very you know free-flowing and everything and i felt okay this isn't going to be too scary but I hadn't really, I didn't even know what they looked like or anything. So getting on the plane, my mom wakes me up at four in the morning. We drive to the airport. It is a beautiful summer morning. We get there, we find out that the internet had gone down and that the automated check-in service and everything, all of that was down and everything had to be done manually. So there was massive lines winding in and around all of the airport when we get there. I, again, have never been at this point in an airport alone. I've always had, I've only flew one other time in my life and it was with my mom. So we get to, through most of the check-in process and of course then I have to go through security. I didn't understand at that point that my mom couldn't go with me. <laughs> and I had a suitcase that was like the size of me that I had checked in. And then I think I had a backpack and I was wearing like a little student exchange uniform, like a blazer and a tie. And basically my mom kind of pushed me along through the security line and was like, I got to go. Like, this is it. She didn't realize that I didn't realize. Anyways, I was furious. I was furious because I go through the security and the people are, of course, like, now you can't go back. Like, you have to go this way. And I didn't even know what it meant to find my gate or anything. And get this. So I get to the other side of the security and I find the nearest payphone. I used a payphone because that's what you did back then. And I had a quarter and I called my mom's cell phone with my with the payphone and what I reamed her out. I was so mad. I was like, how how could you just like push me away? We didn't even get to say goodbye properly. And now like I was crying. I was just like in hysterics because I was like, I have real at that moment, it hit me that I had absolutely no idea what I was getting into and I was terrified. So my mom explains to me that I have to find my gate. I'm in Canada still, I'm in Vancouver. So everything's in English, I'm, you know, 
I'm 18 years old, so I'm not absolutely clueless. So I figure all that out, get on my first plane. Of course, it's been delayed, it's behind because of all the issues with checking in everybody. And my flight goes to Toronto. And then from Toronto, I'm flying to Brazil. And from Brazil, I'm flying to Argentina. So I fly to Toronto. Of course, I'm very late to get to Toronto. Toronto is a very big airport, especially if you've never been in airports alone before. So I'll just tell you that at that point, I ended up walking around the airport just crying until somebody helped me. <laughs> I didn't know what to do or where to go. Um, I might have gone to a desk for like a different airline and they were like, you need to go to this airline because this is your ticket. And um, eventually I got to, I had to take like a, like a, uh, like one of those little buses to get to my gate, to get to my next flight, which then again was delayed and it was stayed on the ground, I think for another hour while I was on that plane. And I have no way of communicating any of this to the people that I'm meeting in Argentina. So then I get like a 10 hour flight later, I get to Brazil and I get out of the plane in Brazil. At this point, you have to imagine I, now I'm in Brazil where they speak Portuguese, English is not the main language and I don't know any idea what I'm supposed to be doing. I have my tickets. I don't know this airport at all. I don't know. And I also can't call anyone for help. Really. I think I did try to call my mom from a Portuguese payphone, but I couldn't figure it out. So then I ended up accidentally going through security in Brazil and I showed them my tickets and they were like, ah, oh, you have to go back through. You're not even supposed to be here. And there was this whole panic thing. And I remember running to my next flight and I think that I made it. And then it was like another two hours or an hour to Argentina from there. And yeah, so then I landed in Argentina got my luggage, was exhausted, and my new family picked me up, and that's when it all started. A funny thing is, is that when I arrived there, of course I had to call my mom to let her know I got there safely, and so we did a collect call, and I phoned her from my host family's house, and then later I think we got the phone bill, and it was $63. We talked for like 25 30 minutes and my mom's like we are never calling again so that's when i learned how to use phone cards and we just did i emailed my mom almost every single day i emailed people every day and ch would check my email constantly because that's the only way i had communication with anybody now i will say this about being a super shy introverted person as an exchange student if you go to a country where you don't speak the language at all you don't have to speak, which is something I'm very comfortable with. I'm very happy to just not talk to anybody and just stare and observe and sit there and not do anything. So I met my host family. They did speak, the first family that I lived with did speak, like I said, pretty great English. So, you know, they asked me questions on the car ride and we, they lived, I landed in Buenos Aires and we drove three hours, I believe, to, where I was gonna live, which is a town called City Bell, English name, City Bell. And this family was, you know, very well off. They had, they lived in a secure, like gated community. They had three German shepherds. They had a pool house. They had a swimming pool, in-ground swimming pool. So I ended up, because Argentina is opposite hemispheres, they were still finishing off grade 12. Their grade 12 year went until December and I got there in August. So I got a school uniform, which I was really excited about, but it ended up being just a white lab coat. And I went to a private school. So it was definitely a whirlwind when I arrived and I had my own room, which was the room of their daughter who was on exchange. And pretty shortly thereafter, I went to get my, my lab coat and they, enrolled me in school and I have to tell you the other thing the 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 crazy mind like warp that happens is you just start having to go along with what pe everyone's doing with n no actual idea of what's happening my family would explain to me like like I'm, we're taking you to school you walk home this way we'll pick you up over here um, these are um, the friends you should have and we have dinner at this time. I didn't really understand what was going on, to be honest. 
So you just like get dropped off somewhere and they point to a door. I just remember the first day of going into that school, I was so miserable. I walked in and it was like an enclosed, like open area for students to gather and all the, the classes were along the outside. And I just leaned against a wall and stood by myself and nobody talked to me. <laughs> and then we went into the class and I'm pretty sure the teacher introduced me. None of the kids spoke very good English. And I found out we were gonna take an English class, but it, I couldn't understand anything that was happening in the English class. But what happened was I ended up being in the same class as a student named Orla from South Africa who had already been there for like six months. And so of course we became friends right away, fellow exchange students, which was a benefit and not in a way because she spoke English and she spoke great Spanish. So I just started relying on her to help me communicate with students and, and just in general, when we would do it, we started seeing each other outside of school and we became friends and we would do things together and she just kind of would do all the talking and I wasn't really learning very quickly. And again, because my host family spoke good English, I wasn't learning as fast through just being immersed in the language, how you're supposed to be. So I was struggling for quite a long time with just being connected to anybody there. I would say it was a very, very lonely feeling. And I was with that family until December. So about four months and just was very isolated and that's when I really started my journal writing. I've always kept a diary my whole life but when I lived there as an exchange student I wrote in a journal every single day. Every day. Because that was the only way I could get my thoughts out. The you know all the channels on the televisions were in Spanish. The radio was Spanish. You almost feel like you're just you're so in your own head because you can't really speak to anybody. So then when Christmas rolled around, I'd been there about four months, I was switched to a new family and I met a new exchange student. So Orla and I stayed friends, but she ended up leaving in January, but I met a bunch of new exchange students when we went on this little mini trip and I met Chelsea from Pennsylvania and a bunch of other kids and Honestly, that was such an amazing saving grace of having more people that could relate to my experience. Um, basically, I just was putting on a brave face a lot of the time for my family at home, for the people that I was living with. I didn't want, you just, you don't want people to know that you're struggling or you're sad because they might think it's their fault and it's not. And this is also a time long before we understood like trauma or depression or anxiety and definitely I was experiencing so much anxiety. I was an anxious person, introverted person, etc. And I didn't understand that. I thought I just had to like stick it out, fake it till I make it, be brave, not complain, and just kind of like suck it up. It definitely wasn't a horrible experience at all, although it kind of sounds pretty stressful. It definitely was stressful. But as time went on, I started to get to know a few of the more kids in my classroom. We started to relate a bit on music. They invited me to their houses. I went to parties. We would play cards. Um, I picked up smoking. I started to love beer <laughs> because obviously their cultures are different. And you know, everybody smoked at that time, that, that era and those kids and I, it was cheap and I had nothing else to do and I couldn't really speak to anyone. So I would just sit at the table and smoke cigarettes, drink beer and watch people play cards. <laughs> After I got to know more exchange students and we were able to start hanging out more, we also became more um, social and, and more adventurous when it came to going out on our own. I explored La Plata, Buenos Aires. We went to the Patagonia, which is all the southern part of Argentina as groups. And, you know, as individuals, we would meet each other. We all were living in different parts of the country. So we would go and stay with each other and kind of see other areas. So it's absolutely incredible. The food is amazing there. The hospitality, the culture, it's so warm. 
everybody kisses each other hello and kisses each other goodbye even my host brothers so i moved to a second family and this second family just was everything to me it absolutely changed my whole experience so i was feeling pretty isolated um, midway through my exchange and then they moved me to a new family and they lived in a very different part of the town <laughs> it was not a gated community instead of an in-ground swimming pool they had like a, a kids waiting pool in the front yard <laughs> and but the mom was a kindergarten teacher the dad worked in a bank they had four sons and they were just so incredible uh, the host mom Marisa she was like my new mom she took the time every day to try and teach me more Spanish because she was a kindergarten teacher I was pretty much at that level and she would have me practice writing and speaking and when we we're at the table how to ask for things and so it just became such a different experience at that point forward I was living in the same neighborhood as a lot of the kids I went to school with and so we started being able to just hang out more often and yeah, it became just, it just was such a life altering experience because about eight months into my exchange is when I started to actually pick up the language and I realized I was dreaming in Spanish. I realized I was thinking sometimes in Spanish, but there will never be a time in my life where I was so absolutely completely alone. I spent so many nights alone before I had friends. And even when I had friends, you know, sometimes I would wait for the phone to ring and no, it wouldn't ring. I just didn't have those very close bonds and friendships you have at home where you always have someone you can reach out to. I had to kind of hope that I would get invited to something. And, you know, I spent a lot of times riding the bus to and from school alone or to go into town alone, or I would just go on a bike ride alone. But one thing that I learned about that is that I really got to know who I was. I really got to know all my thoughts and also understand what I was stripped away from high school. I think high school is such a, I want to say awful time. <laughs> it's such a, you're so, there's so much peer pressure. There's so much identity crisis. There's so much coming at you about expectations and trying to be cool or popular or smart or creative or artistic or whatever it is that or athletic and you just I didn't feel like I had actually ever had a moment to just really just strip it all away I wasn't any of those things when I was living in Argentina I was just this girl that everybody had to get to know and I didn't have any of the things usually that I would use to express myself like sports and things like that to connect with people and I kind of had to just really start from the basics and it was so hard and so lonely but also so integral in me going in on in life in the future um, in terms of understanding how big the world is how important relationships are with other people and also just how much more I wanted to travel and see the world because again that was my first real traveling experience and I think I crammed a lot into that year in terms of all facing a lot of my fears and ended up down the road traveling so much I traveled for I went backpacking in South America for three months um, about four or five years later, I went back and visited my host family. I'm still in touch with my host family, my host brothers to this day. They're just amazing people. And to just find those kinds of connections with people that live completely different lifestyle than you on a completely other side of the world. It's just, it's a beautiful thing. So <laughs> I definitely look back at that time as so hard and so tough and so challenging but just very rewarding at the same time and I encourage any of you that are afraid to travel to find someone to go with you if you're afraid to go alone or join some sort of travel group there's all kinds of things like that out there spending time with yourself at the end of the day I've had to do it over and over again throughout my life when relationships didn't work out um, you know just when you have to start over somewhere else if whether it's a new job or you know you're moving to a new place 
It's so important to not be afraid of having that time alone and taking that opportunity to, to get to know yourself. And I've said it so many times before, but writing in a journal really, it, it helped, made me feel like I had someone there with me. And that was when I was 18 years old and now I'm 35 and I still write in a journal, especially when I'm feeling lost or alone because putting those words and feelings onto paper and being able to, to digest them, it can help you get through that moment. It can also help to look back on those really tough moments and see that you made it through. So one day when we're able to travel again, I strongly recommend, you know, putting some money aside to do that if you can, because it is, so it's, you're paying for an experience. You may not have something tangible and material, um, to show for it, but it's something that's going to create so much growth within you. It's just priceless. So that is kind of my experience as an exchange student. It wasn't what I expected it to be. You know, I thought it would be happy go lucky. Everybody would love me because I'm an exchange student and it would be like the most amazing experience, but it actually was a very, <laughs> very hard time, um, but also very rewarding at the end of the day. So I took Spanish classes when I got home in university and, you know, I've tried to keep it up the best that I can, but it's a little bit challenging because not a lot of people in my hometown spoke it when I got back. But now that I live in Vancouver, I actually have a friend from Venezuela and lots of people at my old gym that spoke Spanish. And so I've been definitely trying to keep it up as best that I can. And hopefully one day I can travel somewhere and use it again. But no regrets, I'm so happy I went to Argentina. It's an amazingly beautiful, interesting, dynamic country. I strongly recommend you go there if you can. Start at the top, go all the way down to the bottom and back. It's stunning. Okay, that's all for now. Thank you so much for tuning in. Hit the like button, comment below if you wanna share any of your travel experiences, if you have something similar. And notification bell if you wanna see when my next story time comes out. We're gonna talk about roller derby. Okay, have a great day. Bye.